Wow, okay. I thought, I thought I'd get a single slot with like a competing talk, but I think Paris and Tim and the others felt the need to let me embarrass myself in front of the maximal number of people. So you're all in here, but I think I've met the challenge, so let's get on with it. Uh, this title slide I ripped off from the standard title slide, and I did draw, draw it in HyperCard, but this uh, slide deck is in Keynote. So let me take you back to 1985. Uh, I have no memory of 1985. I had not even been conceived. <laughs> but some people do, and they tell me that the Macintosh had been released the year before, and uh, the Macintosh team were sitting around twiddling their thumbs, wondering what to do with themselves because they'd released such a great product. Um, one of the Macintosh team members, Bill Atkinson, released Mac Paint in 1985. I thought maybe there's a better picture of him than this little black and white icon. Uh, so I found some. Here he is on the left giving an, uh, doing an interview and on the right sitting with Steve Jobs holding one of the first Macintoshes. This is what he looks like today. He's a nature photographer. Um, Yes, he takes really, really good photos, and he also may um, continues to be a bit of a software developer as well. He's also known for such hits as the drop-down menu, marching ants, the lasso tool, double clicking, <laughs> Mac Paint, as I mentioned before, and finally HyperCard. But he also is in the app business still. Uh, this is PhotoCard. Um, it's basically, it takes one of the, one of the ideas uh, a bit more in a certain direction. So if HyperCard was about cards of information, and this is about photos on cards that you can then mail to people. Um, it's free and it looks pretty awesome. But back to 1985. Bill was wondering what he should do with himself and he looked at the idea of a word processor and thought, hey, I'm into teaching and, and having kids learn stuff. What about a learning processor? Something that, a, a piece of software that helps kids learn. Or maybe not even kids, university students, um, old people. Um, that project didn't really go anywhere, but he did come up with the germ of an idea which was that wisdom relies on information. Applying wisdom relies on having good information. So, what about having some way of organizing information or presenting information? Um, the complete HyperCard handbook has a really good discussion with Bill Atkinson um, in, in, its, in its preface. And um, you can download the whole thing from archive.org. It's 600 megabytes, so maybe not do it here. Um, but Bill gives a, another way of thinking about HyperCard in, in this preface. He says, HyperCard is an authoring tool and information organizer. Um, and the second, the, the last sentence there is, it's both an authoring tool and sort of a cassette player for information. And we're getting a bit uh, cyclical with our references here. Some of you may not know what a cassette player is. But <laughs> if you think of it as a really, really, really old kind of iPod, you get the gist. <laughs> Just to show you how far a, uh, ahead of its time HyperCard was, the very next answer Bill gives in the book is very illuminating. Where did the idea for HyperCard come from? There are a lot of roots to it. One of the early contributors was the Magic Slate project. What's the Magic Slate? Well, it's a laptop computer that has a full page display and an all graphical interface. And no one has ever implemented that at all. I have to find somewhere to put that. <laughs> uh, another way of explaining HyperCard is, well, Bill gave an interview with Leo Laporte in Triangulation, episode 247. He said it was aimed to be a software construction kit for non-programmers. And for purely for historical notes, um, although this doesn't explain HyperCard at all, Bill also drops another interesting tidbit in this interview. He said that HyperCard was inspired by an acid trip that he took <laughs> outside his park, outside his house. Um, and yeah, it. When you, once you've used it, you know, you don't really 
get the idea that this was made by someone on acid, but yeah. But ultimately, and unfortunately, no one can really be told, well, <laughs> obligatory, acid trip now. Um, no one can be told what HyperCard is. You have to see it for yourself. So who here has used HyperCard before? Okay, it's a fair chunk of the audience. A fair few number of you haven't. So let's, let's give it a whirl. Here's a Mac emulator. It's, it's a mini for your back. It um, emulates a Mac Plus. I'll just blow it up there. You have to open a disk for it to boot anything. I have one prepared. Great, now we're running system 7.1. I have a few apps here. Um, I might just fill it with Mac Paint for a bit so you can draw stuff. The, the favorite one that um, I used to use as a kid was the brush mirrors, so you could pick mirrors and then you could like draw in four places at once. That was pretty cool. Uh, that's enough of that though. Um, cool, cool note, Mac Paint files can still be opened with preview. So. <laughs> Onto HyperCard. So this is the, this is HyperCard, it opens to the home stack. This is version 2.1. And I'm just gonna go open a new stack. I'm gonna call it Dev World, yay. And here we are, it's, um, it's a blank canvas. So again, we've got like the, the, the toolbox, we can draw on it. We can like put some text on it. And there's a few other tools here. Um, and one thing you can do with the tools menu is you can drag it off like that. You can also drag off the patterns. Um, a few, I, I didn't realize that when I started using HyperCard, but apparently that's something that's really cool you can do. Um, so this is a HyperCard stack. What's a stack? Well, it's a stack of cards. So let's go ahead and make a new card. It's Apple N, which is gonna be really great. So now I have two cards. You can browse between them with the arrow keys. Card one, card two, card one. And we can go and make a new one. And there's nothing on the second and third card, so you can't tell them apart. But if I go card three and card two, you know, see card two, card three. Ooh. But that's, that's just, not even scratching the surface. Okay, so other than being like a Mac Paint canvas with multiple cards in it, what you can do is you can do some basic programming. I just hit Apple M, this brings up the message box and then you can do stuff like go home. Now we're back at the home stack. Isn't that cool? Go dev, uh, dev world, yay. And it's taken me back to the stack that I made before. So you can do more than just navigation, which is, which is cool. Um, you can do um, dialog boxes quite quickly by going answer who's enjoying this talk with me. <laughs> I didn't give you any other options, but you can add more buttons. Uh, another thing you can do is there's a few tools here. So there's the sort of browsing finger button here. There's the button tool and the text field tool. So what I'm gonna do is here, I'm gonna command drag a new text field there. I'm gonna open it up, I'm gonna change its name to input. I'm gonna give it a rectangle border. And then I'm going to command drag a new button. And we're gonna call this do the thing. It's gonna be a rounded rectangle. I'm gonna show the name, auto highlight and give it an icon. Let's pick Bill. Cool. Um, now, how to make this button do stuff? Well, I'll go back into the button properties. There's a few things here. There's effect linked to script. I'm going to go to script because um, it's the most straightforward. Immediately, it's pulled up a script editor for us, and the cursor is between on mouse up and end mouse up. This script is associated with the button. There is no dragging and dropping lines between code and in in interface builder stuff. It's already linked up. So, great. Okay, so I could um, get the length of card field input, and I can multiply it by three, and I can answer it. What do you think that's gonna do? <laughs> it's gonna take the length of the input, it's gonna multiply it by three, 
and then it's gonna pop it up in a, in a dialog box. Or so goes the theory. Okay, there was nothing in the field. Something, something is nine letters long, so that should give us 27. Yay, it works. Now I'm gonna do something really fast um, and hopefully cool. I'm gonna make a very short choose your own adventure. So, red or blue, red, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna pick this one. And another button called blue, and it's gonna have uh, this button. Okay, cool. Go to card two. Go to card three. Now, card two, back to the start, card three. Okay. There you go. This is not a very interesting uh, choose your own adventure, but you, I did get to choose both options. <laughs> anyway, back to the slides. So the language that I was just showing off is called HyperTalk. And um, most of it wasn't written by Bill, it was written by Dan Winkler, um, who I couldn't find a photo of at all. The last version of HyperCard supports AppleScript as um, scripts as well. And there are all sorts of, uh, there's all sorts of fun things you can do with HyperCard Strix. So I didn't show you it, but I did show you Go. Um, that was uh, the Go keyword, not the, the language. Um, <laughs> And I can also show you OpenStack, which is another method you can receive. So we should, I show you on mouse up, you can go on OpenStack and then run something when the stack opens. These are probably not the technologies you're looking for. So what happened to HyperCard? Well, I have to fast forward to 1997. In 1997, Next Computer was acquired by Apple and Next was the company that Steve Jobs started when he left Apple in the mid 80s. So naturally he became CEO quite quickly and he had to cut some projects because Apple were focusing on so many things. They, um, they cut the Newton message pads, CyberDog, OpenDoc, all these other things you've never heard of, and HyperCard, why? Not so much that it was a successful product, it was ludicrously successful, people loved it. It was killed because uh, the former CEO John Scully liked it, or so the thinking goes. Uh, according to Bill Atkinson, it was also not successful ultimately because Bill um, made a deal with Apple that Apple would have the right to publish it and they never cross-platform ported it to anything. Um, he, he thinks that if, if he had ported it to Windows or something else, it would still be alive today. Um, there was a HyperCard 3 plant um, which added all sorts of cool features like color and during its development, it was announced at WWDC 1996, um, and it, it, was, it was gonna be really cool, but um, Apple obviously killed it in 97, 98, well, not officially killed it. There were still people working on it. At the time, they got part, they became part of the QuickTime team, and then they worked on it, like a QuickTime version of it that was called QuickTime Interactive. Um, and then that just slowly died. The last version of HyperCard for sale was 2.4, and it was last sold in March 2004. So what can we do with HyperCard today? Well, I just showed you you can do, um, basically you can do presentation slides, you can do games, you can do um, drawing, you can um, use it as a flat file database, all these other cool things you can do. Um, but that's not all it can do. It, it's, you can also extend it with um, external commands and functions. Um, and this gets a bit complicated, but I'll try and show you. So here I have macOS 10.7, which is running an emulator, um, which is running macOS 9. <laughs> and now we're gonna fire up um, ResEdit, which is actually, uh, which is well, it's pretty cool. That's yeah, where that jack-in-the-box um, icon comes from. So I'm gonna open up uh, this, um, one of the stacks on the desktop, 
and it's got a resource in it called F XFCN. What's, well, what's an XFCN? It's a piece of code, actually, and um, you can't understand it. I doubt anyone in the room could. Well, if anyone can understand it, just let me know, and I'll see you out. Um, <laughs> you, can you can copy these um, res code resources around different documents and files on the file system. Basically, they live in a separate part of the file that's not the data part. It's the resource fork of the file. And then you can, you can move them around files, and Bob's your uncle. But I didn't implement any XFCNs. What I did, though, was use some that already existed. Let's open up a different one. I'm going to go for, oh, where did I put it? Actually, you know what? I don't have a lot of time. Plow on. Basically, with those um, external commands and functions, you can extend the functionality to do all sorts of things like networking and color and um, you know, retro computing. Retro computing is the use of really old technology to, in the modern age. And uh, XCMDs and FCNs will let me use HyperCard to do something really crazy. So here's a Mac Classic. It's kind of old. Um, it, this one was released in 91, I think. It has the same processor as the original Macintosh, the Motorola 68K. You can upgrade the RAM to four megabytes. It has one megabyte soldered to the motherboard. A nine inch monochrome cathode ray tube display. Again, this might be a bit um, you know, out of the age range of some people in the room. But a cathode ray tube is basically the old form of television which relies on having a mini particle accelerator in front of you. I'm not joking. Um, it has an internal hard disk, floppy drive, a bunch of ports on the back. Retro computing is doing stuff like this. This is a Commodore 64, um, and apparently it's doing Twitter. Uh, to me, it looks like it's just being used as a, a text console attached to a more powerful computer. I wonder if I could do any better than that. I'll have to go through the specs again. So. Compared to a really, really baseline I, uh, iMac today, it's like the iMac is at least 2,000 times better in every dimension. But the Mac Classic has a few things that the iMac doesn't. <laughs> Alas, it doesn't do what I want to do from my computer, and that is Twitter. I would love to tweet from every computer that I own. Hence, Project Slinky was born. I would like to send a tweet from my Mac Classic, from HyperCard. And I'm just going to leave the rest of the details a bit fuzzy. So let's power it up and see what happens. Uh, it's coming up fairly nice. Uh, uh, uh oh. Uh, it's, it's not even a sad Mac. It's like a corrupted sad Mac. It's so sick that it's too sick to tell me that it's sick. So I have to fix it. This is the official service manual. Um, you have to take out all those four screws. Um, they're torque screws. OK, torque screws are pretty easy to get screwdrivers for. But these two are particularly troublesome because you need a long screwdriver. I have one, but I didn't have one at the time. So I tried to make one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bad idea. You know, OK, so I, I jammed it in there. I thought, oh, great, oh, great. The, Sticky tape doesn't hold, doesn't have enough transmission of the torque. So I tried like reinforcing it, no, that doesn't work. In the end, what I did was I got a steel bar and I dremeled a little notch into it so that I could fit the bit in and then taped it up and then I was finally able to unscrew it and there it was with the lid off. That's the cathode ray tube that I talked about before. <laughs> the one with all the high voltage warnings on it, don't touch it. This is a memory expansion board. You have to remove the memory expansion board before you can access the logic board. But here it is, a uh, close-up picture. It's about the same size as a Raspberry Pi 3, which is oop, here for size comparison. Um, there's that high voltage warning again. And here's a view from the back. We've got the cathode ray tube again. There's the memory expansion card. Here's the logic board with all the ports on the bottom. And here's the pa video board and power <laughs> supply. And if it's on fire, you have problems. Here's the logic board again with all the cables removed and stuff. There's the CPU, the Motorola 68K that I talked about before. 
Here's that one megabyte of RAM soldered onto the logic boards. It's only eight chips. The original Macintosh had many more chips for RAM and only had an eighth of the memory. Here's the read-only memory. It just contains the Macintosh toolbox, which you use for programming. And then there's a bunch of other stuff. There's a pram, battery, audio, all the ports. There's the where the expansion slot sits. There's the internal drive connectors. And there's the interrupt and reset buttons, which you can push from the side. There's the pram battery. It tells you, don't do anything funny with this or I'll explode. The service manual also says this. Here's that CPU again. What's wrong with it? Well, it doesn't have any heat sink or fan on it. It does have a fan inside the case, but there's no heat sink. It's so slow, it didn't need one. <laughs> the other problem is it's covered in dust, and the logic board is covered in grime. Where did that grime come from? Well, it came from a leaky capacitor. There are eight leaky capacitors on the logic board of the Mac that I had. And they leaked so well that when I accidentally brushed the Xilog chip on the right, the printing came off. So there they are. To get rid of the gunk, you have to wash the logic board. In you go. There it is. <laughs> give, it a, give it a good rinse. Let it dry. <laughs> once, once it's clean, you're ready to solder. I replaced the uh, electrolytic capacitors with some tantalum ones. They leak less and uh, they, have lower, they have better properties overall. But that's the only hardware modification I did to the Mac. Once that was done, it built, uh, I was able to boot it again, and huzzah, it works again. I had to test it out by playing a, a few games of Lunar Phantom. Now onto networking and how I'm actually going to connect it to the modern internet. This is hard because, well, here's all the ports again. What don't you see? There's no ethernet, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no Bluetooth. All we have really is the serial ports on the back. I suppose I could try and rig up some SCSI interface or something else but local talk it was. I went to Amazon. I found this for $80. It's an Ethernet to local talk bridge. And it was still shrink wrapped. These things were last sold in 98. It supports iMac. Which iMac? The old iMac. <laughs> here's, here's the unboxing. It's got two different Ethernet cables, a straight through connector and a crossover cable. If you know what that means, I'm really sorry for you. Here's the front and the back of it. Um, it takes 12 volts, and it, as I said before, it converts the Ethernet to local talk. So here's the plan. I'm going to attach the local talk interface to this Asante box. Um, it runs at about a quarter of a tenth of the speed of the Ethernet does, which is, again, 100 times slower than modern Ethernet that you might have on your device. TCIP IP. Well, this is the Internet protocol, and if I'm going to talk to Twitter, I'm going to have to talk this at some point. Sadly, the Asante box doesn't actually forward TCP IP frames. That would make everything really easy. So it only does Apple Talk frames. So, OK, I guess I'm going to have to figure out a way of talking Apple Talk. And there is a solution. It's called NetAid Talk. Most people think of this as the software they run on their Linux box so that lets them do time machine backups to it. But version 2 is actually a full Apple Talk, like old world Apple Talk implementation. So I was able to use that and it's support for the various protocols, DDP, ATP, NBP, all sorts of other things ending in P, um, to pretend to be um, some, a server that they could talk to. So um, if you want to pretend to be a Apple share, then you go, you, it, like, use NBP to transmit this name to the network, and then Chooser, which I'll show you in a minute, will think that you've got an Apple share. Um, I did this um, with a Go program that I wrote and it registered the name Gophers in your Apple Talk colon AFP server, and there it is running. It's also the Raspberry Pi is also sharing some files. Um, there's a whole pile of Apple Talk um, protocols, and you can read more about them in, inside Macintosh, which was the, the programmer reference for old Apple developers. You can download the PDFs for free from Apple. OK, so here's the plan. And I have a few minutes left, so I'm going to really try and get this done. It's going to have Macintosh Classic Talk. It's going to run a hypercard. It's going to have an XCMD loaded into the stack, which lets it do Apple Talk transaction protocol, which is going to run on DDP, which is going to pass through the Asante Talk box to the Raspberry Pi, which is running a server written in Go. And it uses the NetAid Talk library to serve the request coming in from the Mac Classic. It will then tweet what I type into the request, and it should respond with, who knows? Okay, demo time. 
I really hate this place. Which bag is it in? Does anyone know? <laughs> Not in here? No? Okay. <laughs> we'll have show and tell later, but um, here it is. So there's the back of it, that's the front of it. So what's happened now? Well, it's quite simple. <laughs> I left a floppy disk in there. I turned Do Not Disturb on. I don't know why it's doing this. I can drag this out if you want. <laughs> How do I turn it off? No worries. There we go. Okay. I'm using it on the side too. It's really annoying. Okay, Mac. So, there we go, Mac going. Okay, there's the mouse, let's get rid of those. Now, I'm just gonna check that it's got network connectivity, so I'm gonna go to Chooser. And from here we should see the Raspberry Pi it's connected to sharing its file set server. This is a very good sign, which means it works. And let's just connect as guest. There's my file share. Ah, we're all looking pretty good. I'll just put out that. All right. Now, I'm going to open that hypercard stack that I prepared earlier. And over here, I'm going to run a server. Cool. What? Okay, fine.
Right, we're live. Okay, this should, this should work. Okay, here's the HyperCard stack. It's just got a text field. It's got two buttons. It should already be connected. So let's find out if this will work. Uh, being annoying. Okay. Big moment. Hello. I'm Macintosh. It sure is great to be out of that bag. <laughs> Hashtag bag life. Hashtag dev world. Hashtag project slinky. Tweet. Did it work? <laughs> ah, no, maybe not. Don't worry, I have a backup for this. I'm gonna click this button. Did that click? No? Maybe I didn't enable the highlight. Oh, well, let's just click that again, see if it works. Really wasn't expecting this. Ah, and sees it. Loaded. Oh. Really? Really? Let's just check what the button's going to do. Ah, yeah, it doesn't have auto highlight on for start. They see one another. Well, that's not what's going on. Really not the point of this exercise. <laughs> oh. 
Let's see what I'm doing. Okay. Let's go. No, not the icon. That's not what I want. I click that. Oh, well, I'm just going to have to get it to work next time. <laughs> I don't think we've got time, so here's the links. Here's the thanks. <laughs> I tried. Thank <laughs> you.